Hi everybody and welcome to the 100 Pounders meeting of Overeaters Anonymous. My name is Rita Q. The, the, today's date is the 14th of July in 2021 and we have the lovely Gary D today to speak to us from Miami. Uh, though we mightn't be in Miami today, but we'll let him explain his experience, strength and hope. Take it away, Gary. Uh, good morning, kids. I'm, I'm a recovered compulsive eater and a member of the Saturday Solutions Group. My name is Gary. Hi, yeah. Um, so let me tell you the rest of Chuck's story. <laughs> uh, no, I don't, I don't know Chuck, or I would. Um, so um, uh, I've been in OA, I'm, I've been an active member of Overeaters Anonymous. August 1st will be 33 years. And I've been uh, pretty much in the center of the room for those 33 years. Like uh, I, I came in and um, I came in through a treatment center and um, I was 5'9 and weighed 340 pounds. And the same day I came in, uh, an anorexic came in, like we came in together out of the elevator together. Um, and she was 5'9 and weighed uh, 96 pounds. So we walked in looking like the number 10, like, like she was a straight line and I was this round thing. And it was like Sesame Street. Like this, you know, today's treatment has been brought to you by the number 10. So, um, but I, like I said, what happened was uh, I had never heard of OA or anything like that. I don't even know how I ended up in treatment. I had decided to commit suicide um, and I had a plan. It really, like um, I, I made a couple of half-hearted attempts before um, to commit suicide, but um, this time I, I had a plan. I was in academics, I'm retired now, but I was in academics. So for us, the year starts in August. Like August is the, you know, like August is when like New Year's starts. Um, so I'd made this decision that if nothing changed by August, I would commit suicide because it seemed like the most uh, loving thing I could do for my family. And, and for the rest of the planet, it just seemed like, uh, uh, and, and I know, I don't mean to encourage this in anybody, but I have to tell you, from where I was, suicide would have been a step up. You know, uh, I don't, uh, I don't belabor that a lot, but I remember when I first came in, my first sponsor at some point said to me, what if you don't die? Like, what if this doesn't kill you? What if you have to live another 10, 15, 30, 50 years like this? And I was like, oh, man, shoot me. I had much rather die than live another 30 years like that, man. Just the misery of it, um, the self-hatred, you know, lying to myself every day that today I'm going to stop, today I'm going to stop. And, um, I would eat. Oh, yeah. Uh, so I said I'd be in the center of the room. That's where I was. Um, and I really believe in that. I've, I've always heard that the that, uh, members at the end of the herd get picked off. It's in the center of the herd where there's safety. And I've been... I think I was six months into recovery before I uh, ended up at Intergroup. And within a year, I was at Region. Within a couple of years, I was at World Service. And aside from the service stuff, I've just always been involved in whatever my Intergroup is doing. And uh, I don't always enjoy it. I frequently don't. Uh, uh, in fact, most of the time, I don't. There's a reason it's called service. Um, this is kind of off topic, but I remember my, my first service position, really, uh, my Intergroup had decided, this is when the Brown Book came out. When I came in, uh, there was only AA material. And then the Brown Book came in. So my intergroup decided to put the Brown Book in every library in Dade County. Uh, half the year I live in Miami now. Um, so we decided to put the Brown Book in every library in Miami. And it's a much tougher job than you would think because it has the word God in it. When you're trying to get a book with the word God in it into school and into libraries and stuff, you know, stuff happens. Um, so originally there were five of us on the committee, then three, and we all kind of resented each other. Like you said you would do this, you didn't do that. Like, now, as you're doing service, it's not always, and you're working with other people. And I don't think any of us had more than three years. Um, so we were still pretty crazy and still pretty uh, easily frustrated and aggravated. But we got through it and we got the lot books into, into whatever libraries we could. And it was a pretty awful experience. Um, but then, like five years later, I'm in a meeting in Hollywood and um, Hollywood, Florida. And um, this young woman gets up to share and she says there was her first meeting. Uh, she's uh, bulimic and she had been throwing up 10 times a day and she couldn't stop. And then she found this OA book in her library and everything changed, you know, everything like, like, <laughs> like the fact that we do all that and that's, you know, uh, some bulimic somewhere was able to like, and the, the lessons in humility I had in sitting there, not wanting to jump out of my seat going, that was me, that was me. <laughs> like just sitting there going like, like, what a wonderful thing. I mean, anyhow, um, so like I said, I've always been in the center of the room and I, I, I recommend that um, highly. 
Um, my friend Bernie used to say the people in the back of the room are usually the loafers and sneakers. These are the people who loaf around and sneak out whenever they can. And don't like, uh, you know, uh, I have friends who have been in OA for decades and have never worked the steps. Um, you know, I mean, and they come to meetings and they complain about the reading and you know how I can't get it. But uh, I had coming to OA and not working the steps is like is like joining a bowling league and not bowling. You know, so, uh, the fellowship is great. I, I don't mean anything. I love the fellowship. Um, but there's something called being seduced by the fellowship. You know, we can get together and the women braid each other's hair and they stroke each other and they love each other, um, but then they don't work the steps. It's like um, uh, the fellowship is wonderful, but the program is the steps. And in fact, what the fellowship is, is a fellowship of people who work the 12, live, work and live the 12 steps. <coughs> Excuse me. <coughs> so, um, like I said, I came in, I, I threw myself in. Um, the first step was really painful for me, but what a relief to live in reality for 10 or 15 minutes. You know, like um, I had been so delusional, but like I, I had always known I had a, a, a weight problem. I always knew that I was fat because I was. I was fat since I was a kid. And um, by the time I got here, I was morbidly obese. Those last four or five years in disease, I couldn't stop eating at all. Um, and I prayed a lot. I didn't believe in God, but I prayed a lot. And um, uh, I, you know, I, I would pray that God would handle my weight is really what it was. Like I wanted to eat whatever the hell I wanted to eat. And it wasn't until I got to OA that I realized I had a food problem. And I, when I did my first step, I wrote out my food history and there were things in there that just, uh, I, I had to admit were insane. There were things in there that just weren't, weren't like, you know, people don't do that. Like uh, that, that's just, I would eat at night until my belly distended. And when I got into bed, eventually, like three in the morning, if I rolled over onto my stomach, I, uh, the food would come up and I'd wake up choking to death on my own vomit. Um, and it was very painful because this was food I binged on. So it wasn't like I chewed it or anything like that. So my throat was all torn up and um, I would calm down, wait for the pain to go away. And then in order to go back to sleep, I'd have to go get something to eat. That's how I lived. You know? And um, one of the things in my first step, um, so when I was a kid, I lived in the Caribbean with my father. My, my father was hiding from the federal authorities and I was hiding from uh, New York state authorities. So we were living in the Caribbean. And um, he was also a compulsive eater and he was going through one of those periods where the way he dealt with it was to get rid of all the food in the house. So there was no food. Um, and I was alone and I didn't have a, a transportation then. And um, so I was alone in the house and there was nothing there and I was having a carb break. I mean, a serious car craving. And I had a thought. And it's worth noticing that all the stories in, in, in the chapter more about alcoholism um, all start with like the, the guy with the mug said, Suddenly I had a thought. Or the guy who retired and says, He fell victim to the belief that, you know, like, and that's why today I have to tell you, I don't romance my food thinking at all. When a food thought comes in, I do everything I can to get rid of it as soon as possible because I know if it percolates in there long enough, it's going to win. Um, it's just the nature of my mind. So anyhow, I had this thought that the only food in the house, the only carb in the house, we had a German shepherd and the German shepherd had mug bones, which were dog biscuits. And once that thought came in, you know, at first it was like, you can't eat a dog biscuit. And then, you know, three minutes later, I'm eating a dog biscuit. And it was, it was absolutely disgusting. I found it horrible. Um, and the second one wasn't any better, nor the third, nor the fourth. And uh, here's the thing. Nobody does that out of choice. You know, if I had any choice, I wouldn't be eating dog biscuits. You know, that, that's the thing that you really have to get about the first step about, about having a compulsion. Once I've eaten against my will, once I've, I've held something in my hand crying, don't let me eat this and eaten it anyway. Um, there's no way to, uh, there's no way to say I would never do this. I would never do that. Of course, I would do whatever compulsion led me to do like a compulsion, you know, um, so I, I just knew it. I, I knew this about myself. I knew that my will was meaningless when it came to this stuff. So, um, so I took the first step. I mean, it's really you know, over over one of the, the archways in Dante's Inferno. You know, the levels of hell. Over one of the levels of hell, there's a sign that says that says, um, "After such knowledge, what forgiveness?" Like once you know this about yourself, there's no way around it. You know, and, and taking the first step, while really unpleasant. Um, 
it's a chance to live in reality, which I had never done before. I had never really lived in it. Like, I had never looked at the consequences of what that meant that I ate dog biscuits, you know, that that meant I was severely mentally ill, which is what the second step tells me. And, and I don't mean to offend you, but if you have an eating disorder, it means even according to the books, according to psychology, psychology books and crap, uh, you're severely mentally ill. That's what an eating disorder means. Disorder, uh, all disorders are mental illness. I mean, that's, uh, <laughs> uh, I, I, of course, with, we also have the allergy, which makes it a little bit of a separate case. Anyhow, uh, so I took the first step and um, I wasn't an atheist. I wasn't an agnostic. Uh, I really couldn't care. I, I was just uh, obnoxious is what I was. I was obnoxious. So I was going to argue whatever side you were on, I was going to argue the other side. You know, so my sponsor believed in God. So I was arguing with him about why there's no God, how there can't be a God, you know, like the Holocaust, you know, all the nonsense your sponsees throw at you in that first couple of weeks, you know, the Holocaust, all this stuff, you know, was, like, then why is there cancer? Like, 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 I want to solve the, you know, the answers to these riddles. And he said to me, there's something so important. And if you're a newcomer, I hope you get this. He said to me, I don't give a hoot what you believe. He didn't use the word hoot, but you get the general idea. He said, I don't give a hoot what you believe. He said, you can't manage your relationship with a fork. So God hasn't chosen to reveal the nature of the cosmos to you, Moses. He said it just like that, like, like, who do you think you are that you should know this stuff? Like, the holiest people on the planet have dealt with this crap and haven't come up with an answer. And he's going to talk to you. So, would you imagine going over to a her an active heroin addict and say to him, "Tell me the nature of God." You know, like, <laughs> like, no, tell me this stuff. It was just, uh, it was just so important. And then he said, he said, "Look, if you want to get well, you need to come to believe this." I don't care how you do it, but you need to find a way to come to believe this. And I did. Um, everybody I knew who had the recovery I wanted believed in God. So I made the decision to believe in God uh, because I wanted to get well. And I was taught by, by him and early on that if you're not willing to even to attempt to believe in a power greater than yourself, if you're not willing to even attempt it, it means you want to eat more than you want to get well. I mean, it's a real simple thing. I mean, can you imagine like going over to somebody with tuberculosis or end stage cancer and saying to get well, all you have to do is believe in the tooth fairy and the Easter bunny. Uh, if you do that, you'll live. Uh, odds are, you know, odds are, oh, tooth fairy, uh, they jump at that. You know, in the big book, it says, you know, to accept spiritual help or go on to an to a alcoholic death, uh, sometimes weighty choices. But it's only a weighty choice if you're, if you're really an end stage addict, if you're like, <laughs> if you have even a drop of sanity left in you, it's a pretty much a no-brainer. Die or a miserable, lonely death or just be miserable for the rest of your life or believe in this. Um, so I chose to believe in that. And I, uh, and I have. Um, I have convinced myself of much weirder things. I'm always a little bit hesitant to say this at an OA meeting because it's so feminized. But the number of times in my life I have convinced myself that that stripper really likes me uh, is beyond imagining. <laughs> like, so if I can believe that, <laughs> I can make myself believe in God. Um, so I did, and here's what happened. Uh, two days later, I got on my knees because that's what people told me to do. I got on my knees, and first when I was in treatment, there was this woman named Mallory. She was like the head therapist lady. And she had just come back from India. So I knew she was holy because God kind of lives in India. You know, like that's a, the reputation, at least, is that like, India is much holier than Brooklyn or something like that. Like, it's just, you know, more God. And she had just come back from India, and she was wearing Birkenstocks and a lot of linen. So you knew she was close to God. So I got on my knees, and I said, God, I'm a friend of Mallory's. Because I wanted him to know I wasn't just some schmuck. I was, you know, I had connections. And then I said, I don't know where these words come from. I still get choked up every time I think about this and say it. But what I said was, Dear God, if it be your will, please redeem me. Please make me new. And I really don't know where those words came from because um, like redemption really wasn't part of my lexicon. It really wasn't part of my upbringing. It wasn't like, uh, who thinks about redemption? Well, except for uh, holy people. Um, so that came out of my mouth and uh, I cried. 
And uh, here's what happened. God redeemed me and he saved me. Um, and of course, the, the rest of the steps were essential to the process, but the sincerity of that prayer, I believe, changed everything for me. Um, it's not just that the sky was bluer and the grass was greener and that kind of stuff, but it just changed my attitude toward life. You know, like, um, uh, I started to try to live by spiritual principles. It was that simple. Just tried to live by spiritual principles and, um, and trying to contribute to the planet. And it would just change everything. Like, I had always thought I had a getting problem. Like, I didn't have enough. I needed more women, more sex, more money, more, you know, and turns out I had a giving problem. Um, and what I had to learn was how to give. And um, to this day, I have to tell you, I think that's the greatest gift of the program is, you know, when you come in, they tell you, we will love you till you learn to love yourself. Uh, the people I came in with said to me, we will love you until you learn how to love others. And um, that was the real gift. I, I did come to love myself with, with, with time and practice and, and patience. But I had never thought I could be a loving man. I come from a, a severely abusive background and uh, sexually abusive and physically abusive and uh, loving others just didn't seem to be in the cards for me. And, um, and not, to, not to brag, but I am a loving man. I, I love people, I love uh, humanity. And, and uh, I, I don't like everybody. You know, like, there's a hundred and some odd, like 175 people on this thing. But the odds of me liking all 175 are pretty slim. Um, so I know me, I'm a judgmental bastard. Uh, but but um, uh, loving everybody is like, like a natural occurrence for me now. I, I didn't think that would ever be possible. I, that's one of the biggest gifts I got from the program. Let's see how I'm doing on time. Oh, three minutes. Um, uh, I want to talk some more about the steps. Um, fourth step was a... Uh, you hear a lot of bitching and groaning about the fourth step. I got to tell you what a blessing it is, man. If you've been doing any of the readings in the meditation books, like our meditation books, it makes it very clear. But um, you know, Bill Wilson says in the big book that we are, we are not led to this life by virtue. We are led to this by necessity. But what a great gift. What a blessing that we're forced to do a fourth step. I don't know, but my, my belief is that the vast majority of people on this planet come to the end of their lives without ever knowing who they are. You know, without ever having any real sense of what I'm about, what I'm like, what my fears are, what my what, what triggers me, what makes me crazy, like, um, and we're forced to discover that. And what a blessing! Like, I really, you know, one of the sayings in AA is, you know, know thyself. It's on the coin. It's, uh, you know, it comes from Socrates, of course. But um, uh, but man, what a thing to 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 be forced to get to know who I am. What, what frightens me, what moves me, uh, the, the things that I've done. Um, it's just, it, it gives me a chance to have a life that's authentic. You know, that gives me a chance to have a life that really lives up to who and what I wanna be. You know, at, at the end of Death of a Salesman, the play, the, um, they're at the funeral, and I hope that's not a spoiler alert, but at the end of Death of a Salesman, there's a funeral, um, hence the title. Um, so at the end of Death of a Salesman, they're at the funeral, and his son Biff looks down at the grave and says, here's the real tragedy. He never got to know himself. Um, and these steps, among many other gifts, uh, have led me to that. Um, I'll say one quick thing about the eighth step because it changed me so much. I told you I come from this really abusive family and I was getting on the eighth step and getting ready to make amends to my father particularly, and my, and my mother, both of them. But, um, you know, I had stolen some money from him here and there, and I had lied, and I'd done this stuff. But the list of things I had did to, done to him was like that, and the list of things he had done to me was like, you know, you go, you go to jail for that crap. <laughs> like, what he did was way out of proportion to what I was making amends for. And I was showing this to my sponsor, and he, I kind of expected him to say, well, in your case, it's different. Pat me on the back and say, you can go ahead. In fact, if every now and then you have to eat because of this, it's okay. Um, and what he said to me instead was, I was telling him all this stuff about my dad, and he goes, why don't you just forgive him for that? Just as casually as like, why don't you turn on the lights? Why don't you just forgive him? And I was like, I heard that, like, why don't you just levitate? Uh, and I ended up forgiving him. Now, I know there are a lot of abused people on this line. <clears throat> I'm not trying to tell you to forgive. That's entirely up to you. That's a very individual choice. But he taught me that forgiveness doesn't mean forgetting. 
<coughs> forgiveness doesn't mean placing myself in an unsafe position. So forgiveness simply means we, uh, surrendering my right to revenge. And I was able to do that. I surrendered my right to revenge. Oh, that's my 20 minutes. So, um, it you know, gave me a happy life. And the last thing I want to say is, um, God, this program and you people have not just saved my life, but given me a life worth living. If there's ever anything I can do to return the favor, please let me know. And thank you so much for letting me ramble on like that. Chuck would have been better. <laughs> thank you, Gary. Thank you so much. If everybody can give him the jazz hands and we can turn off the recording now. Thank you.